If you're an early riser, then you've seen many dark nights turn into the dawning of a new day. I know I just love those early moments. You can't help but feel that the hope of something new is beginning. Welcome to Through the Bible. Today in our final study in the Old Testament book of Zephaniah, we'll study the end of Israel's dark night of judgment and hear about the light of a new day. Our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, will begin in chapter 3 at verse 9. Now, as you find your place in the Bible, we're delighted to welcome Greg Harris, through the Bible's International Director for a visit in the studio. Greg, why don't you share with us how we can pray for our ministry around the world today, specifically as we're taking a look at Russia and the countries that now make up the former Soviet Union? Well, Steve, there is a lot to pray about in that part of the world. And really, the ministry there has changed a lot. We've seen a huge change in the landscape, and we're now broadcasting inside the country, which is very exciting. We have broadcasts in Moscow and St. Petersburg, Mm -hmm. and these are interactive call-in stations. And and you were recently there, weren't you? I was. Not long ago, I actually participated in a call-in that takes place right after the airing of Through the Bible. You speak Russian? Uh, No, I had some help. Oh, okay. (laughs) I have help wherever I go around the world, Steve. And it was so exciting that right after the broadcast ended, they opened the phone lines and people people called called in and they asked questions about Dr. McGee, who he was. It was just a really, really exciting time. I'm sure that was very encouraging, both for them and you as well. Yes. Now, As the Soviet Union dissolved, um, you would think that a lot of the religious persecution went away as well, but that's not necessarily the case. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Well, it's complex and more subtle than it used to be. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we don't get into politics on the air, but the way governments behave toward Christians in their country has a huge impact on how they can express their faith. And so, basically, Steve, we just need to pray. Right. Well, let's read a couple of letters that we've recently received that express the gratitude for Through the Bible's Mm -hmm. work and all of God's Word going into Russia. Here's a letter from a listener we received who lives in Moscow. Dear workers in the Lord's Vineyard, thank you for your lectures Through the Bible. What valuable material, rich with illustrations for our daily life and immortal souls. These lectures help me as a pastor to prepare spiritual food for the people in the local church. I linger on each point and ask the Father to show me the eternal value. Everything else is like grass. Only God's word endures. (laughs) That's beautiful. And here's another from Kazakhstan. I am listening to your program. Praise God. I can learn more about him. The New Testament I know, but the Old I read just recently. Mm. Therefore, I am listening to your programs with the Bible studies with great attentiveness and joy. Is it true we will study through the whole Bible? Mm. This is good news. Thank you so much. Well, those are two very encouraging letters. Mm. If you would like to pray for this part of the world and the entire world, along with other listeners of the broadcast, you can join our world prayer team by going to ttb.org forward slash pray and signing up for a daily email that will help you do just that. In the meantime, let's open in a word of prayer as we begin our study in Zephaniah. Lord, thank you for the impact that Through the Bible continues to have in the former Soviet Union and in Russia. We pray that you would bless our study in Zephaniah. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, friends, the storm is over as far as this little book is concerned. This little book of Zephaniah opens with dark forebodings. It opens with rumblings of judgment that are ominous. And we have been through it. In fact, the last time when we took the first part of the third chapter here, is judgment of the city of Jerusalem. It's almost frightening to read. And then it is frightening when you come to the last, and it's the picture of the great tribulation period, when he judges all nations, and they will be brought up against Jerusalem in that last day. 
so that actually you have two kinds of judgment here. God's judgment of his own people, and that is always chastisement, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, he child trains, he disciplines, and then God must judge the unbelieving world, and that is the picture that is before us in this little book. And therefore, this little book is like a Florida hurricane, a Texas tornado, a Mississippi River flood, a Minnesota snowstorm, and a California earthquake all rolled together. And you would think when you read this that God hates his people and he hates mankind in general, that he's vindictive, that he's cruel, that he's brutal, that he's unfeeling, and that he's unmoved. But the story that we told at the beginning is the story that illustrates this little book. It is the story of that man that took that little child in the darkness of the night and rushed her away from home. It looked like he was kidnapping her. And it was frightful when he turned her over to another man who plunged a knife into her innards. And my, that was a frightful thing. But when you know the whole story, it was the father that had a little girl, his own little precious girl, that had been having attacks of appendicitis. And so it was at night that he went in and picked her up and rushed her to the hospital and put her into the hands of the family physician. And in tenderness, everything was done. But we find today that our great physician, he takes his own and he puts the ones he loves on the operating table. And even in judgment, God is love, even when he's judging the unsaved. And when he's judging those that are his own, God is love. And we saw last time that this world in which we live, the final curtain is coming down. Someday man's little day will be over. And then judgment comes for lost mankind. But God will restore his children. And we're going to find out that what we endured down here was actually a blessing in disguise. Now, with that in mind, let's come to this. And as we do, let me put before you another little story again, one that actually happened of a boy that was in school, and he was away from home, and things got rough. The lessons were difficult, and he was homesick. And he wrote home, and he said, Dad, it's hard here. The assignments are too heavy, and the dormitory is too strict, and I'm homesick, and I want to come home. The father writes back a stern and severe letter, and he says, you stay on there. You study hard. You apply yourself. You get to work. And when the boy gets that letter from his dad, he says, I don't think my dad loves me anymore. My dad couldn't love me or he wouldn't want me to go through this torture that I'm going through here. Well, we got a heavenly father that tells us, you stay down there, you're in the college of life. I'm preparing a place for you and I'm also preparing you for that place and I'm preparing you down there in the world. Now, with that in mind, let's turn to this passage here, verse 9. For then will I turn to the people's a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. Now, God has this far-off purpose. This is called the teleological purpose of God. And we'll find it all through this section here because now we're in the light, no longer in the darkness of the judgment, no longer in the day of the Lord that begins at night. Now the sun has arisen and light has broken upon mankind. For then, he says, will I turn to the peoples a pure language. Now when he says here a pure language, he doesn't mean that everybody's going to speak Hebrew. A great many people think that's it. And he's not going to turn them to some other language that is 
maybe some unknown language, and that everybody will speak that. The pure language that he's talking about here is not what some of us Texans thought. We thought it was going to be the Texas accent. Many of you people that have not agreed with my accent and you found it rather distasteful, I thought for a while that you were going to have to get uh, accustomed to it because that's what everybody would be speaking in heaven. But honestly, it doesn't mean that at all. The pure language means exactly what it says. The language will be pure. There'll be no blasphemy heard. There'll be nothing that's vile and vulgar. There will be nothing that'll be repulsive. The language will be that. We had a neighbor one time. She was a very big-hearted woman in many ways, and she was unsaved, and she had not only a mean tongue, she had the vilest tongue that I think that I've ever heard. And actually, it was offensive to people in the neighborhood to hear her lose her temper at times, and you could hear her throughout the entire neighborhood. And it was very distasteful, so much so that some wanted to report her. Well, in heaven, friends, there'll be nobody to report because it's going to be just exactly what this says. A pure language will be pure in thought, word, and deed there. And that is the thing that he mentions here. And they'll call upon the name of the Lord and they'll serve him with one consent. There'll be no rebellion against God in that day. Heaven, friends, is going to be a really a nice neighborhood to live in. It's going to be a glorious place. You're going to have some good neighbors there. Now, verse 10, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my disperse, shall bring mine offering. Now again, here is a verse of Scripture that has been variously translated or interpreted, and they come up with all sorts of interpretations that the ark is down in Ethiopia and that it's going to be brought up to Jerusalem at this time. Well, I don't think that that is the thing that he has in mind here at all. It does mean that Ethiopia is a nation will enter the millennial kingdom. I believe that is the thing that is important for us to see. And their offering, of course, will be the offering that Christ made. And there are many myths, and in fact, there is a tribe down in Abyssinia or Ethiopia today that claim that they are Semitic, and they use the term, it's sort of like the word Philistine, that means immigrant. And they claim they can trace their origin back to Israel, that they are Israelites. Well, I think that is probably true. But I think we are reading a great deal here into this that doesn't belong here at all. And I think we just let it stand in its plain wording here. Now he goes on to say, verse 11, in that day, shalt thou not be ashamed of all thy doings in which thou hast transgressed against me. Now he's talking to his own. We have seen that one of the things that God was judging them for was that there was no shame in the vile acts and their gross immorality. They were not ashamed of it. It's like the sins that were committed. When I was a boy, they were always done in secret. Now they're done right out in the open today, but God's people will never reach the place where they can be satisfied in sin. If you can live in sin, you can be sure of one thing, you're not a child of God. If you can be happy and live in sin, you're not a child of God. The prodigal son was never happy in the pig pen, and he had to say, since he was a son of the father, I'm going to go home to my father. That meant he wasn't a pig. Pigs love pig pens, but sons don't love pig pens. They want to go to the father's house because they got the nature of the father. Now, he makes that very clear here. In that day, shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings in which thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of the midst of thee 
those who rejoice in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty in my holy mountain. This is the day when the meek shall inherit the earth. They're not doing very well today with it, by the way. The other crowd has it now. Verse 12, I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. When the Babylonians took Israel into captivity, there were about three deputations of slaves taken, but they never took all of them. They left the poor and the afflicted the cripple and all that sort of thing, never took them with them. And you can imagine how they felt. It was terrible to go into Babylonian captivity and become a slave, but it was actually worse to be left behind. And God says here, I intend to take care of the afflicted and the poor. And if you'll notice all the way through Scripture, we've called attention to it before, the Lord always mentions the fact that he intends someday to see that the poor get an honest deal, that they will be treated right. And the only one in the world today who has a program for the poor is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are poor and needy, he's the one to go to. He can help you, and he's the only one that can. Now we read in verse 13, it says, The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity. That is the picture of the remnant. God's always had a remnant, and there will be this very large remnant in the millennium. They'll not speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Now, will you look at this verse with me for just a moment? First of all, when he says that the day's coming when they won't do these things, that would seem to indicate that they did those things. Even God's people indulged in sin, but not permanently. They can't, as we've said, they can't live in it. They may get their feet dirty. They may get down in the pig pen. They just won't stay in the pig pen. That's all. Now he says, the day will come when none shall make them afraid. Now with that verse in mind and saying that all of this has reference to the day when God puts them back in the land and gives them the land. Are you prepared to say that what is happening and has happened in that land today is a fulfillment of prophecy? None shall make them afraid? Well, they haven't had a moment that they haven't been frightened ever since they've been in that land. And that is their picture. Now in verse 14, and here you come, to the day when the kingdom is going to be set up on the earth by the king. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. The Lord Jesus has now come to the earth, and evil has been put down, and the knowledge of the Lord will cover this earth like the waters cover the sea. Now he says, In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not. But Jerusalem is afraid even today. And to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. In other words, be busy for the Lord. Now we come to this marvelous 17th verse. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Now, God has a purpose. And he goes through the night, the night of judgment, in order to bring us into the light of a new day. And he does all of this that the day might come when he can rest in his love. Now, God loves you today and he loves me. I don't know about you, but I doubt very seriously whether God could rest in his love for Vernon McGee. He could say, well, look, he's not perfected yet. He seems so immature. He seems so filled with 
false. He's apt to digress. He's apt to detour at any moment. God can't rest in his love today, friends. But the day is coming when we'll be in his likeness and when we're in his likeness after he's put us on the operating table why he's going to bring us to himself. What a wonderful and glorious picture this is. And it continues, I will gather those who are sorrowful for the solemn assembly, who are of thee to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Behold, at that time, I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that is lame, and gather her that was driven out, and I will get them praise and fame in every land where they've been put to shame. At that time will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you, for I will make you a name and a praise among all peoples of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. Oh, this is the day of light that has come, and it'll be glorious for the nation Israel. It's going to be glorious for the church also because God is putting us through, many of us, through the furnace, and he's putting us through trials. And I think that one of the glorious things about heaven will not be the golden streets, and it won't be the gates of pearl, and it won't be the fact he's going to wipe away all tears. The glorious thing in heaven is going to be you and I are going to thank him for every trial we had and every burden that he put upon us. I close with this wonderful little poem. Out from the mine and the darkness, out from the damp and the mold, out from the fiery furnace cometh each grain of gold, crushed into atoms and leveled down to the umless dust, with never a heart to pity, with never a hand to trust. Molten and hammered and beaten, seemeth it ne'er to be done. Oh, for such fiery trial, what hath the poor gold done? Oh, twere a mercy to leave it down in the damp and the mold. If this is the glory of living, then better to be dross than gold. Under the press and the roller, into the jaws of the mint, stamped with the emblem of freedom, with never a flaw or a dent. Oh, what a joy, the refining, out of the damp and the mold, and stamped with the glorious image, oh, beautiful coin of gold. Someday, when you and I are in the presence of our Savior, we'll thank him for every burden, every trial, every heartache, we will thank him for dealing with us as a wise father deals with his children, and we'll thank him for the dark side of his love. Oh, my friend, this book has a tremendous message for us today, the dark side of love. So until next time, may God richly bless you when we turn back to the little book of Jude in the New Testament. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. There will be a day, and it's coming soon, when our long, dark journey will be over and we'll enter into an eternity in the Lord's glorious presence. In that day, we'll thank Him for the dark side of His love. I hope that this series in Zephaniah has been an encouragement to you. If it has, would you write and let us know your story? If you enjoyed our study in Zephaniah, we think you'd appreciate Dr. McGee's message called The Dark Side of Love. This sermon is available in both a CD audio format or as an e-booklet that you can download free from ttb.org. Now, many of you have asked about the poem that Dr. McGee read at the close of today's study. You can find a copy of that poem called In the Crucible, as well as any other poem Dr. McGee reads in our studies on our website. Or as always, just call or write to us and we'll be happy to send it to you. Our phone number is 1-800-65-BIBLE, and our address to mail your request or to send us your letters is through the Bible, Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. We love your emails, too, so don't forget that method at BibleBus at ttb.org. 
The Bible Bus is returning to the New Testament tomorrow as we begin our studies in the book of Jude. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be right here saving you a seat. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain, be washed in white as snow. This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of the worldwide ministry of Through the Bible Radio Network. Thank you.